Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. I forgot my last name. Video number two in our series, last video, we built a powerlifting program that includes all the stuff we need and the first week of training. Now we're gonna show you how to run that program all the way from the first week to the second, third, fourth, et cetera, through the deload and how to start the next hypertrophy program. So here we go. We were talking about the program a bit last time. Then we're going to talk about how to figure out the length of the training program, which is to say mesocycle, because we we'll probably have to figure it out, how to progress on relative effort, like how hard to train every week and how much harder than last time we got to train. Oh, Greg just said, little Iago, parrot, jab, same person. Um, volume progression, how many sets to add, if any, usually we don't, we'll get to that in a bit. And of course, how to do deloading, how to start the next hypertrophy meso, and then lastly, we'll talk about what the next video is going to preview. So. Here we go. Sample program we built last time. Feel free to pause right now and take a look at it. If you really have no idea what the fuck's going on, because what the hell is last time, check out the video in this series and this playlist that came right before this. We'll teach you, or there we taught exactly how to construct this program. Just a sample, but we're going to work off of this. All right. So progress is a trippy thing because it really does depend on mesocycle length. You have kind of a minimum requirement for how hard to train, how much to train, and a maximum ability. And depending on how many weeks are between these two, it sort of depends, uh, it really chooses our rate of progress for us. Like if you're trying to train for six or eight weeks straight, like your, your, your rate of progress is gonna be real small each time. If you're trying to train for three weeks straight, I mean, your rate of progress could shoot right up to the moon. It's just not sustainable if it's longer. So we definitely have to figure out how long the meso is because that will determine how fast we progress. The meso length can be determined by a bunch of stuff. First of all, it's how far are you from the next meet? So for example, if you know you need about uh, six weeks of training to peak, and you know about at least eight weeks of training to train for basic strength, now you're at 14 weeks out, and then you need at least eight weeks, let's say, of hypertrophy work, well, then you have a choice between a mesocycle that's like four weeks long or eight weeks long. Probably stupid to do a six and then a two. That doesn't make any sense. And anything in between is probably weird. You could do like a three and a five or something, but now at least you know you have eight weeks, and the logical structure is probably four weeks and then four weeks, or some for some folks, just eight weeks straight. So that's number one. And hypertrophy mesos, the accumulation part, can be between four and seven weeks long, including deload seven weeks. So to, to be completely fair, it can be longer than this. In general, especially for intermediates, for whom this video is really targeted, four and seven weeks total is probably best, which is to say three weeks of accumulation and one of deload, all the way up to six weeks of accumulation and one of deload, okay? Can you do seven weeks of accumulation, one deload, so one stretch of eight? You can, but you may not be able to survive that with realistic improvements. The fatigue chronically would just be way too high, but you might be able to try that so give it a shot, especially if you know your recovery abilities are really, really good. So within that range, you choose via meet scheduling, training age and recovery ability. If you're super fast, super quick to recover, you can do longer men's cycles if you want. And if nothing else, trial and error. You could say to yourself, well, you know, I've done five week men's cycles before, there's no problem. I wanna try a sixth week, try it. And if that last week goes total dog shit, you're super fatigued and you're like, all right, five is the limit. If that sixth week goes super great, take a deload on the seventh week and then maybe next time try seven or eight weeks, no problem. Trial and error is a big part of this. Just start with something realistic. Don't be like, I wonder if I could survive a 12 week accumulation. Like, what was the best one you did? You're like, man, I was pretty fried seven weeks after the last one, like 12 sounds pretty dumb. So keep it realistic. All right, relative effort progression. Things have to get harder over time. In hypertrophy training, we add either reps or load or both to make stuff harder and harder and harder. In powerlifting hypertrophy training, adding reps takes us out of a repetition range and or isn't really specific to the general strength increase we want that hypertrophy to power. Remember, most of the science so far on what causes muscle growth says adding reps and adding load really is just an option. Adding either one as long as you're in the target rep range is totally cool. The beneficial effect of adding load, beneficial effect of adding reps is it improves your work capacity more. Uh, same hypertrophy. Beneficial effect of adding load is same hypertrophy, but your strength improves more. Which one do you guys think we're going to use for powerlifting hypertrophy? Here's a pretty hard rule. We add load to the bar whenever possible and not repetitions. Will that work with dumbbell laterals? No, you'll have to add reps because you can't add you know, 20, 25, 30. That's insane. It's way out of your rep range. But 
if you're doing most of the powerlifting assistance movements, high bar squats, stiff legged deadlift, so on and so forth, you're almost always going to want to add load to make the session harder, not actually add repetitions because that is not specific enough. It's not optimal. Now, once you know your meso length, you're going to say, okay, week one, we already know we have to hit an RPE or RIR of, we'll just use RPE, it's convenient, but you can look on here, the RIR equivalents are on here, an RPE of seven in the first week, and in the last week before deload, an RPE of 10, because we want to fucking fry out the last week, struggle, really just push it to the limit. Otherwise, why are we stopping if we could be pushing it further? We know it's seven here. We know it's 10 here. And then we interpolate all the RPEs in between. So if we have, you know, a few weeks, it can be week one, seven, week two, eight, week three, nine, week four, 10. If it's more weeks than like four at a time, then you can stretch out and have like the same RPEs or some people even do fractional RPEs. I don't know what to think about that. I don't know how accurate it is. Like a seven slash 7.5 here, you know, 7.5 slash eight here. What basically we want is on average, the RPEs to go up over time, starting at around seven, which is where most programs should start and ending at around 10 and all the other RPEs being somewhere in between the two. You can use a stepwise function, you can use a linear function, no big deal, just stuff has to get harder on average over time. Once you interpolate these, you want every single week to add just enough weight to last week to hit roughly that target RPE. If you make a mistake and you way overdid it, take the weight down or push the weight up to reflect. And you can even do that set to set to set. For example, last week we squatted 300 pounds for you know three sets of five or whatever we had to do. Sweet. This week, that was last week was RP7. This week's RP8. All right, what would RP8 really be? And a lot of this comes down, you get really good at it if you do it for a long time. Multiple uh, macro cycles of this kind of training and you really get used to like what an RP jump is as far as weight and it's different for every exercise. But let's say like, okay, 310 pounds for fives, I think will be an RP8. You do the first set and it's like an RP6 or some shit, like nervous system really changed, your technique really changed, your work capacity improved, your strength improved from that last workout. And all of a sudden you're like, dude, that was not eight, that was bullshit. So you hit a set of five, stop at whatever you did last time, same reps as before, and it's 310 pounds. And you're like, okay, that was not an eight, that was a six. I'm gonna go to 330 because 330 is probably gonna be an eight. You go to 330 and that was like a nine. And you have another set, let's say, you go to 320 or 325, oh, marron, fucking beautiful. That is an eight, you're golden. But now you have better information. You're like, all right, so 325 was an eight from last time it was 310. What do I need to do to get to a nine next week? Well, you know, last week 330 was a nine. Maybe next week 335 is gonna be a nine or 340. That's your guess. And you can always change it set to set, alter the load, not the reps, so that you get as close to the RP that you want for the average of all the sets in the workout. It's okay if some is lower and higher, just as long as you're trying your best to average it out. And look, if you hit it on the dot the first one, don't fucking change anything. Stay with the same load until and unless that load is untenable to hit that RPE. No big deal. So if some of the sets are six and if some of the sets are nine, no big deal as long as you're making the adjustments. It's no point at all to get anal about the shit, right? You do a set of five and you're like, fuck, 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 that was RP6. No! like SGW chaos rage mode. And then there's no reason to do that because you can just increase the weight on the next set. And look, if it was your last set and you fucked it up, no big deal. You'll get it done next time. Long-term slow progress is how people get brutally strong. Do you imagine an interview with like Larry Wheels? You're like, hey, Larry, you know, what was the, you know, what do you regret <laughs> about your powerlifting career so far? I think, man, you know, this one workout in 2019, I went RP 6.5 and I fucking should have done seven, bro. I should have fucking done seven. Like, what the fuck? That's not what makes a difference over the long term. Just try your best, right? That's it. Now, if you can't do the reps, if you fail to match the reps with a, a slight load increase, or you get the same reps, but you have to auto-regulate down to the same load as last time, you have hit your maximum recoverable volume. You had better hope deload is next week. If it's not next week, you have to take some recovery sessions, light sessions or something, because your cumulative fatigue is too high, because you're literally not getting stronger anymore. That's a problem. We want to get stronger in that rep range. That's the key to powerlifting hypertrophy. It's also another good reason why you don't want to blow your load too early. Right, So if you think, ooh, I could go 335 or 330, just choose 330. 
Worst case scenario, it's a little too easy. And you can up the ante on the next set. And if there's no next set because it's the last you know session or the last set of the session, you can up it next week. And if it's not the last week, if it's the last week and there's no upping it, up it next mesocycle, up it next macro cycle. No big deal as long as you leave yourself potentially some breathing room better than hitting the wall early. If it's the last week of training before you deload, yeah, you can fucking push it. Realistically, of course, don't get yourself killed. But if it's not the last week, err on the side of a little bit less because you need that breathing room for next week. Two factors in progressive overload. Can you get a great workout this week? Middle finger. Can you get a next, you can your next week also be good? Because if you're having such ball of workout this week and you need another week that it fries you, fatigues you, and your next week sucks, you fucked up, right? It's like going to a restaurant and their dessert is amazing, but you eat so much of the main course that you can't even eat the dessert. You, you fucked up, you, you, you know, like good luck. You know, you won't be in that restaurant for another six months and people are like, oh man, those, what the fuck is a dessert? Those crepes were so good. You know, like, God damn it. I shouldn't have vomited all that pizza or I should have vomited more of that pizza so I could have put it in the dessert. I don't know about you guys, but after I throw up, I don't really want to eat anything. And the most baffling thing, side note, like in college, the idea of puke and rally, where you like get really sick from drinking, but then you throw up and then you like keep drinking, bro, it was never me. I've thrown up my fair share at parties. Officially for me, when I throw up, my night is over. Like maybe I can go and like try a little diner food, but to be honest, like fucking done. Fuck that. In the comments below, let me know if you've ever thrown up and continued drinking. And if you have done that, you are a commendable wild animal. All right. What's up next? Volume progression. Volume is important for hypertrophy. You don't just be, you want to be doing one set all the time because that could be insufficient to cause gains. Great for strength training, but if you're doing that, you might as well be in the three to six rep range. Kind of pointless to do low volume in the hypertrophy range of five to 12 reps. Kind of dumb. Now, Load progression is still king. You want enough volume to get you into that growth range, but volume progression is great for causing hypertrophy, but we want to progress in load because we want that hypertrophy to be good, maybe not the best we could have, good, but also incredibly well transferring to strength. It has to be a thing, all right? So what you wanna do is start your volume at something like your minimum effective volume. We already talked about how to do that. And then you progress via load only, don't add sets, until at some week you have RIR zero or RP10, okay? You can't go any further, fine. And think to yourself, could I have done another week of RP10 and hit another mini PR? Okay, so if you did like 300 pounds in the squat for sets of eight, and it was like every set or like sets of, you know, sets of eight of 300, 290, 280 or whatever. And every set was basically to failure or one from failure. Can you think to yourself like, okay, next week I can fucking totally do that with 305 on average, right? Just a little bit more. I can hit all the same reps. Um, if the answer is yes, you hit your RP 10 and you didn't hit enough volume to hit your maximum recoverable because hypothetically you could do more. Now, if you really don't know and you have an open-ended plan where you're not planning on, on um, deloading at a certain time, you just go until you can't, you can try it. Try another week. Bump your, you know, you, of course you have a plan. Like, okay, I'm going to do five weeks up and one down. But at the end of your fifth week, if you're like, dude, I'm fucking money. I can keep going. Try it. And if you succeed, well, then you know whatever volume you had on average was too low. So if you succeed, then the next mezzo you want to probably progress in sets a little bit. So for example, let's just say you did three sets of everything in one mesocycle. And at the end, in your last week, you hit RP10 and everything, but you're like, dude, I can do an RP10 next week. I'm not even that fatigued. I can fucking hit another PR. Eh, you didn't hit maximum recovery volume. You're not milking the hypertrophy program for everything it's worth. Next mesocycle or next macro cycle, whenever you do that program again for hypertrophy, maybe you start at three, but halfway through the program, or just generally as you feel, you inject a little bit more volume and then you <laughs> inject a little bit more, hopefully just volume, you know, USAPL testing here. So if you started at three, maybe go to four, right? Don't start at four, start at three, but then slowly over time, add a set here and there to various exercises and, and at four sets of everything. And then see in that last week, okay, am I at my MRV, right? Because after a while, you get good at judging this, you can figure it out. Like you guys know what I'm talking about too. Some of you have been training longer. That last week of RP10, someone's like, what do you think? Another week after this? You're like, Ooh. 
what are you fucking nuts? I'm going to die. There's no way I'm like 20 pounds weaker next week. If we go and test me, I need to deload. And if you think like, ah, 50, 50, it's cool. Just can it. It was enough volume. If you think, man, I can totally do another week. I'm being a little bitch. Next time, add more volume. Over time, you're going to learn your body really well. And it's not a big deal. Now, as you get more advanced, your added fatigue from every load addition is going to be way higher relatively. Also, more advanced people have higher minimum effective volumes and lower maximum recoverable volumes. That means going from one to the other isn't as big of a step anymore. Eventually, advanced powerlifters, whatever volume set number they start a program with is usually the one they end it with. All of that fatigue, all of that bandwidth is filled up just by load increases, which makes things simpler. But when you're a beginner, when you're advanced, you'll need to add sets every now and again to keep that process going, right? The target, the goal, how you know your volume is right is if you hit RP10 or RR0 and MRV in that last week. You tried your very hardest and you can't go any further. If you can go further, well, shit, you need more volume. Because somebody could say, well, you just need to put more weight on the bar. Well, I put the maximum amount of weight on the bar because I hit RP10. There's no RP higher than that. Fuck that RP11, bruh. Hey, people say that shit. I guess it's just a meme. You know, it's impossible. Maybe Superman could do it. Yeah. All right. That's your whole accumulation phase. What do you do for deloading? Here's a good approach. Oh, again, not a dogma, not a religion. It's just a decent approach. That critical thing about deloading is to take at least some weight off the bar and contract the volume a ton because the volume is what really fatigues you. Some people deload with really heavy singles. They just do very few of them and they leave the gym and it fucking works. Not my preferred method. Here's my preferred method, but fundamentally, Deloads, any way you design them, have to be much less, much less absolutely critical. So first half of a week, you have a whole deload week. First half of the week, you can reduce all loads to week one loads, okay? So you worked up from 300 to 330 in the squat, okay? In your last week, 300 in your first, 330 in your last. In your first week of deloading or first half of the week, 300 pounds back to week one, which like, yeah, it's not going to feel super light, but it's not the end of the world also. And here's a kicker, do the same number of sets, but cut all the repetitions in half. So let's say you're doing sets of eight with 330, like uh, five sets of eight with 330, like in your last week, fuck, that's brutal, right? In your deload week, you're gonna do five sets. You're gonna do sets of four, however, and it's gonna be with 300 pounds. I mean, four reps with 300 pounds compared to eight reps with 330, it's a world of fucking difference. Here's the thing, when you try this for the first time, or if you tried it before, you'll know, that's still a pretty fucking hard workout. It's not a workout that adds a ton of fatigue, it's definitely reducing fatigue, but it's still kind of like, ugh, why is it so hard? You're used to 330 for, you know, five by eight, why is, you know, five by four at 300 hard? Cause you're so fucked up, cause you're carrying so much fatigue, but it conserves your strength and improves your technical abilities a little bit more. So it's really awesome. If that's too much for you, you can definitely lower it cause you don't want to feel like it's the end of the world. Now, second half of the week, here's the real deload, deload part of the deload. That's like four deloads or something. We reduce all of your loads, 50% of week one loads. Week one for us in that example is 300. You put 150 on the bar. Fuck, that's easy as shit. You should be embarrassed to do your last part of the week. You should still do it, but you should be embarrassed. You know, it's like you borrow the minivan from mom to go hang out with your friends. I sure hope nobody sees me driving this thing, right? Same idea, like load 150 pounds and people like, oh yeah, I thought you were powerful. If you're like, <coughs> yeah, no, I am, bro. Just you know, deload week. And they're like, I don't know what that is. Are you just this week? And you're like, God damn it. <laughs> Why didn't you see me last week? I had a situation where I was at gym once and I was doing the first half of my deload. The week before, also visiting the same gym, I was there for like two weeks. I did a high bar squat. It was 440 for 10. Okay, my top set. And I was like, yes, it was like an all time PR for me. Super big deal. And then uh, I had a guy catch me on my deload and I was doing, I did 425 for like, a double or something in the deload. And this guy watched me do it. He was like, damn, dude, that's really impressive. And it's just sort of super mixed feelings because I was like, thank you. It wasn't very nice. I was like, thank you so much. Thank you. And then I was made a joke. I was like, should have been here last week. And I was really impressive because it's kind of fucked up. People compliment you about shit that you're like, meh, right? So this is really kind of embarrassing. 50% and all the sets are half the reps. And what you can do is that workout right there is going to take you like, fuck, it could take you like 20 or 30 minutes. So instead of coming to the gym four times a week on your deload week, you can do this. Come in twice for the first two workouts that are harder and heavier in the first half of the week, just like normal. 
they'll be 45 minutes instead of like the usual hour and a half. And then for that last two workouts, combine them. So instead of coming in Friday, Saturday, just come in Friday, instead of training 20 minutes and 20 minutes, which is fucking driving more than training at that point, just come in and do Friday for 40 minutes and you'll have the whole weekend off and it'll be super awesome, super easy. Give that some thought. But again, whatever you do, make sure you're still practicing the lifts because you have to practice the lifts you're using to be very good at them, a huge part of powerlifting. And it's easy and it makes you feel more recovered, not less, especially towards the latter half of the deload week. Every single day, you have to feel better and better and better. If you do a deload workout and after it, you feel way more fatigued than you did before, especially a couple hours after, if you're like, oh, that's not good. You're not really deloading because you're not bringing down fatigue. Now, what about the next hypertrophy meso? If you have another hypertrophy meso cycle planned, you can begin it right after the deload, same as this one in these past two videos. You can keep the same exercises if they're going super well. That's probably a good idea. If they're having great, great stimulus to fatigue ratios for you, awesome, keep them. Or you can make the exercises a little bit more powerlifting specific. So for example, if you were doing, if you had two mesocycles of hypertrophy, and in your first mesocycle of strength after, you're going to start doing low bar squats. If in your first mesocycle, you were doing front squats for quads, super, super choice. In your second, maybe you can do front squats, totally fine. Or you could do high bar squats. High bar squats are heavier and biomechanically much more like low bar squats than front squats. So if, if you're going to make a change, don't do this. This is what I don't want you guys to do. Don't start with high bar squats, then go to front squats. And then in the first meso of strength, go to low bar. That's fucking ass backwards. It's less load, it's less specific, it's a poor transfer. Because if the last thing you did was front squat with a bunch of weight, and now you gotta go low bar, you're like, fuck, I gotta put a bar on my back, what the fuck? Like, I'm not used to this shit. It's awkward, it sucks. If you're going to change exercises, take them from less specific to more specific for strength. Easy. So if you're doing like a ton of close grip benches and jam presses in the first meso, when you're doing uh, your second meso of hypertrophy, try just regular competition width, but with a gentle pause, in, uh, or sorry, a gentle touch instead of a pause, and, and just some work that looks more like your competition bench. Then in meso three, when you do your first strength meso, you can do your competition bench with a pause, and the transfer is easy. You don't want the other way around. You don't want to do a bunch of uh, touch and go benching in your first meso, and then in the second meso, do a bunch of close grip and jam, and then get to competition benching. You're like, what the fuck? Like, I don't even know where my hands go. Fuck all that stuff. And of course, when you start that meso, Volumes go back to a minimum effective volume. Reduce your loads to your best guess of your new RP7 or RIR, or sorry, <laughs> your RP7 or RIR3 loads. New guess, because it could be updated. It should be updated. You'll probably be stronger. And begin to move up and load again, just like you would for the other ones. That's all we have today. Now, after doing one or two or three of these mesocycles in a row for hypertrophy, you're nice and jacked, and we're going to take that new muscle and make it stronger. In the next video, we'll talk about powerlifting program design for basic strength. See you there.